Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, we are being joined by an international group of analysts, and we are hoping that we have an international audience, so I'm basically covering all my bases. Welcome to the third event in our ongoing book forum series, featuring Rajesh Vida Raghavan's Patching Development, Information Politics and Social Change in India. I'm Ranjit Singh. I'm a researcher at the AIGI team at Data and Society, and I'll be your host alongside my colleagues, Nazali and Rico behind the scenes. Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. Data and Society began in New York City, an island note in a large network of hills, rivers, and mountains in the Atlantic Northeast, known as the Lenape Hoking, the ancestral land of the Leni Lenape people. Today, we are connected online via a different network, a vast array of servers, humans, and computers. In the United States, much of this system sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we recognize this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory around the world. We commit to dismantling all ongoing forms of settler colonial practices and their material implications on our digital worlds. So talking about this event specifically, uh, I'm gonna start with talking about Rajesh a little bit. Rajesh is an assistant professor of science, technology, and international affairs a program at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. His work uh, that we are going to focus on today, Patching Development, is an effort to reimagine the role of information and technology in development projects. Rather than contending with the binaries and appropriation of data-driven technologies, with the optimism of leapfrogging and digital transformation of societies on one hand, and the pessimism of human suffering on the other, Rajesh examines the hierarchical structure of bureaucratic interventions through digital technologies and social technical systems to sidestep the politics of local arrangements and implementation of government projects in India. He addresses such interventions as patching development, a term which must be fairly familiar to anyone conversing with practices of coding. If you would like to quickly get a better sense of patching development, please check out Rajesh's post in our ongoing series on points on the digital welfare state. In fact, the series as of now also features a post by Sylvia Macero, who is an associate professor of information systems at the University of Oslo. She has joined us as a panelist along with Rajendra Narayan, who wears many hats. He's an assistant professor at Azim Premji University in India, and he's also an activist, a public intellectual, and a rural development practitioner. Both of them have joined us from different parts of the world, despite the challenges of navigating time differences. And we are so grateful that you're all here with us. So I have a lot to say about this book, but we have such an exciting panel with us. So what I'm gonna do is to I'll, I'll give the stage to Rajesh to provide us with brief remarks introducing his work, followed by a discussion among our panelists about how the book resonates with their own work. After spending the first half an hour on a panel discussion, we will take questions from the audience and conclude with another invitation to Rajesh to tell us what he would like us to take away from his work and this conversation. So we'll begin and end with Rajesh. And as Rajesh is talking about his work, I invite all of you to basically just write questions that come to your mind as he's talking about his work. And I'm going to try and incorporate all of that in the discussion that we'll have, uh, along with the questions that I have that I would like to pose to the panelists. So Rajesh, on to you. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for Data and Society uh, and Ra Ranjit, Rigo, Nazil, uh, Rajendra, and Sylvia, uh, and and others who who joined in. Uh, it's really uh, it's really uh, an opportunity to kind of try and like talk about the book. And one thinks that you're done with the book after so many years of work, but it's it's not there. So I'm actually very thrilled. To, to be able to talk uh, and take your questions. And I'm actually very eager to kind of see what, what uh, uh, discussions make of the book. Um, so I wanna, you know, 10 minutes or 12 minutes, I'm just gonna give you a very, a flavor of the book and, and also kind of tell you a little bit about my, uh, how I came to these questions and what my method is and very broad takeaway. So it's gonna be very, 
you know, hopefully a superficial, not not too superficial, but hopefully a, a kind of a broad. Uh, or I also want to thank Ranjit for you know uh, forcing me to write a blog post and also paying me for it. So which is very remarkable that you know that 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 that, that kind of forcing function with money and uh, pressure. So there's a blog post that kind of over you know gives you a summary of 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 the book. So the book is about the implementation of a development program on the ground uh, and the politics of using information and technology uh, by a state bureaucracy. Uh, I had a long route or a route to get here and had an atypical path to academia. Uh, I, I was a software developer for a number of years and became interested in the question of development uh, and was introduced to development through uh, my volunteering work uh, which is very popular, uh, a group which is very popular in the U.S. campus is called AID, Association for India's Development. We had a slogan that we used for fundraising that I barely understood at the time, that all development questions are interconnected, uh, questions of health uh, is related to questions of employment, education, costs, and increasingly, uh, I'm going to argue on information and technology. Uh, so one vexing question that, that bothered me was this often repeated statement that Welfare programs do not uh, reach the poor. India remains one of the most important places for somebody to study this as a country with deep inequalities, as well as a place with a lot of digital experimentation, both for, for good and not so good reasons. Uh, in, in particular, my, my, folk, my work focuses on, as Ranjit was saying, on the last mile problem uh, in, in, in implementation. I ask how can uh, development programs deliver benefits to marginalized citizens that expand their rights and, and freedoms? Under what conditions do uh, and how do states can react most effectively to the, to the local exercise of power at the last mile of in implementation? What role um, information and technology could uh, uh, play in this implementation? Let me see if I can get the slides up. Um, the oral argument, the main takeaway, if you get anything out of this talk, uh, I want to kind of shift the focus on the politics of implementation and deserves full attention in both scholarly and policy uh, uh, realms, right, in effectively implement, implementing uh, welfare programs. Political will and good design of policy, which occupies rightly so a lot of energy, uh, uh, you know, is, is, is critical, but implementing complex big programs in an unequal setting often have to deal with resistance uh, from local power systems. Reformers do not have the capacity to fundamentally change this power uh, through direct confrontation with local elites. So the local system of power is hard to transform, not because of, you know, inertia, uh, uh, but because of counter strategies from powerful actors at the local last mile. Uh, this means contesting power through the focus of, I would argue, minutia of how documents are maintained, where records can be kept, can be made at read only, where to conduct public meetings, whether to read out findings uh, or should you throttle it. In other words, focusing on seemingly technical details is not a technocratic act but a very political process that, that need to be recognized as such and not just uh, focused on the big P politics. Um, patching is about the uh, fight over the power of the last mile, the untidy realities and, and the back and forth struggles between citizens and between the bureaucrats and the state. And I'll explain that in a second. Uh, I wanna also say that we wanna you know, maybe this is not news to this audience, but we want to disaggregate both the state and citizens and ex examine concrete relations between them, and particularly with, with respect to technology and data, not just have this uh, state on one hand and citizens the other, kind of disaggregated, and I hope I did that in the book. One striking uh, example of the process I describe uh, in the book uh, is, of course, this uh, study of NREGA, the NREGA, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, and the Right to Information, or the RTI. 2005, uh, these are two landmark legislation, uh, right, rights-based laws that was passed in India, which gave students both the right to work and the right to information, which granted all citizens the right to government records. Uh, NREGA is one of the largest, or if, if it depends on how you count it, uh, largest employment, public employment programs, which broadly have two, two goals, to provide employment on demand 
and to build rural infrastructure. The rights-based social entitlements, I want to stress this, and, 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 and guarantees of transparency embedded in NREGA and RTI for a fundamental departure from, from rights, from typical welfare programs in which citizens are seen as passive recipients uh, uh, of, of benefits. So there has been lots of focus in I, I you know, did my uh, PhD uh, in, at Berkeley. There's a lot of focus on how uh, pro programs don't work uh, and what do we need for the, for, you know, Tanya Lee, uh, anthropologist talks about, irrespective of the fact that there's will to improve of doing things and their development, in, in our case, 200 years of uh, research uh, uh, points out that these programs often fail and uh, lots of focuses on, what I call first mile problems, which is both on the supply side and the demand side, which is how do you get the states to actually, as Stuart Corbridge would say, see the state or see the poor? Uh, and is it political competition? Is it electoral competition? Is it organic, uh, organized collective action? Is it social movements demanding It'll get them for the state to even pay attention to these two to people? Uh, and similarly, a lot of focus, particularly by development economists, look at looking at impact, measuring impact of these programs, right? Uh, through randomized control trials and 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 also in, increasingly political scientists are getting into this act of uh, how do you design these programs should you actually have a woman serpent or a leader would that would that uh, lead to a better outcome and and thinking about design and impact right uh, yet as as uh, there's a lot of studies here yet as john Drez, uh who i believe uh, and i i think uh, you know was one of the you know, he doesn't like this word, architects of, of Enrega, uh, a development economist and activist, and somebody who deeply cares and, 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 and believes in Enrega points out, in the context of implementation in a highly unequal setting where private contractors are typically involved and there's a, percent, a percentage scheme that siphon off money uh, meant for development, right? So the capacity of local actors to capture state programs and resources is based on both their social, local social and economic power, the alliances they build among themselves and their capacity to exploit unequal access of, of uh, information. In other words, thinking about the politics of implementation, how to overcome, is an important process to, to examine. So the, the, the propositions in the book uh, are based on a total of 18 months of ethnographic research in India. Uh, for those of you not familiar with ethnographic research, this is basically a participant observation, me going and spending some time uh, in communities in Andhra Pradesh and Bihar, uh, but I spent majority of my time in Andhra. This was before Andhra Pradesh got split into Telangana, for those of you uh, keeping track. I did this field work in 2011, 2012 with, with follow-up visits in 2016 and 2017. My work is broadly in three different phases with the different institutional focus. One uh, focus is on Understanding so the social audit process, uh, which is uh, which is very different from a financial audit process, where usually you examine records uh, inside a room. Here, the the uh, social audits as an as a, as a as a process was pioneered by MKSS, a social movement in Rajasthan. The Andhra Pradesh government took it uh, because and you know Enrega actually had it had it specified in the program uh, and Andhra uh, uh, implemented. So I studied, uh, spent two months traveling with the auditors and being an auditor myself, uh, doing door-to-door -door surveys, participated in public meetings. That's the first phase. The second phase was looking at bureaucracy and learning about uh, how the, the tussle with technology that happens within the bureaucracy at the state, district, and mandal levels. I spent a lot of time with the computer operators, uh, examining state documents, uh, interviewed bureaucrats, both upper level and lower level bureaucrats, activists, and politicians. The third phase uh, was to understand the pro uh, program from the perspective of workers. I located myself in two different contexts, one, one Adivasi and one uh, in a tribal uh, setting and a Dalit habitation in a large agricultural village where I find and uh, lived and sometimes worked uh, on the Enrega worksite. Uh, I can attest as a detour, I can attest the fact that it, the unskilled work is not unskilled. I barely cope and I document how, you know, uh, it, it was very, very, uh, uh, you know, we need to reclassify uh, how these things are defined and we get away with, uh, uh, things like un unskilled labor. In event, so the uh, the Adivasi case did not make it to the book, but I did I written a separate article. Those of you interested in uh, in reading it in 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 in, a, in, a, in world development. I also want to kind of point out because this comes up um, in in discussions and how do I uh, treat the bureaucrats? And because I'm saying disaggregate the bureaucracy, 
but the upper level bureaucrats uh, are also politically constrained. Similarly, like the lower level bureaucrats who are actually part of the local power system are constrained, both they are part of the problem in some sense, they're also suffer from the influence of the local po po politician and landowners. So it's a much more messy story uh, in, in how the uh, bureau bureaucracy is, uh, uh, is treated. Uh, and, and, and I examine, of course, the last mile problem. So in some sense, I don't examine the, the struggles and the, and the you know, uh, corruption, if you will, of the upper level bureaucrat. So the story actually starts uh, after the political will is established. So there is a little bit of, uh, you know, if you read it, you know, and you might see that, oh, you know, this, this, there's a villain in the story is the lower level bureaucrat, but that's actually not true because I, ex I hope I clarify that in, 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 in chapters to kind of explain the particular configurations that, uh, that, that the, this, this project is about. Uh, to help us understand the scope of what's in, involved and just to kind of taste of why the Andhra process went this way, you know, one of the chief architects of the pr program, uh, Raju, he identified himself as a Dalit uh, and he was the uh, principal secretary in, in Andhra uh, and he was guided by, the, uh, by you know, B.R. Ambedkar's vision of how he saw power. Right? Ambedkar, uh, the architect of India's constitution, uh, and, and, and a Dalit icon and, 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 a, and an Indian icon uh, more broadly, asked what is village but a uh, sink of uh, localism, a den of ignorance, narrow-mindedness, and communalism. Under the oppressive conditions of hierarchical caste order, Ambedkar did not have faith in decentralized politics would necessarily help Dalits and other marginalized uh, people. He argued instead the state should erect safeguards against social and economic oppression at the local level. So he was convinced, he in this case, uh, Raju, was convinced that he needs to take away powers from everyone at the local level and siphon and the, those who siphon funds from a centrally control and centrally control the implementation of the program. So the bureaucrats uh, sought to use state action to neutralize the local power nexus in the villages with the support of civil society, civil society activists and Enrega workers, though they had the civil society act, uh, there's a lot of, you know, patching actually happens in this process of creating the social audit institution. It's non-trivial. How do you construct a social audit process that is, can tap into uh, information at the local level, but still have control over the process and not being corrupted by, uh, by the local uh, structure. So that there's, there's a couple of chapters describing how this institution itself has to be patched. Let me, uh, so this, I'm not gonna go through the slide. The, just the one takeaway in the slide is there's a lot of different institutional mechanisms that exist in the literature that allows for decentralizing power uh, and divulging power, but under bureaucracy, with an Ambedkarian vision went a different way, a largely centralizing control of the process, but trying to overcome the problem of, uh, of, of local information. The question is, is there a new pathway of local implementation given this context uh, of unequal uh, power? And, and the, in this slide, in, in this, in this uh, 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 picture, you have, uh, so this is the Andhra process. I mean, I don't like the word model, you know, because it's—I don't think it necessarily translates. But it's—it's—it's it, it, it's, a—it's a process where you have upper-level bureaucrats and and lower-level bureaucrats. There's a, there's a bit of a dance using technology, monitoring, and and controlling the everyday acts of 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 of, of governance. It's not just simply like biometrics and having payments uh, uh, going well. It's actually controlling what works gets done. And and I describe the kind of level of. Uh, how technology kind of amplifies the control that exists. So it's not new, government circulars always existed, they always were patched, but the extent to which the bureaucrats were using technology to control. So that's one angle. The second angle is social audit process where how do you get local information? You get local information at the local level. How do you get to, to that local level? You actually travel there and you created a social audit institution that would go down to the field, to the village level, talk to the workers, inspect work sites and do audits, do public meetings uh, and uh, find that information and then triangulate that with, uh, with the official records. Uh, so so here's, here's a slide that shows different kind of you know, interactions with the social audit bureaucracy. I call it the participatory bureaucracy where they actually go out to the field, conduct meetings. And again, it's all about managing power. 
and there's a dance again between where do you go do you go to the village level do you go to the uh, they call it the mandal which is a you know which is a sub block level to get that because if you go down to the village level the centralized uh, the, the the district bureaucrats lose power because the power is the sarpanches and the the local elites have a lot more power so they actually have village meetings but then they also have um, mandal meetings where they have you know the local elites don't have that kind of power and so a lot of patching actually happens in the institution so it's not just tech uh, has to have patching. The institutions go through a lot of changes in uh, how they react to uh, to local power. Uh, I have not defined patchings. Let me define this for you uh, in in one second. The the practices through which Indrega was managed was was I call this uh, through a process of contestation within the Indrega bureaucracy, between both pressure and cooperation between groups. Uh, using this idea of patching, I just want to just give you a vignette of how I came to this idea of, of using patching as a metaphor uh, of how, how Indrega operates in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, it first occurred to me uh, actually in an, uh, sitting in an office uh, of, of, of the principal secretary of rural development in Hyderabad. Uh, he was having a brainstorming meeting with a bunch of software developers, software engineers from a company. The, talk, the topic was something very like, I mean, I, I'm making it bigger than it is when I was there. <laughs> it was just, I thought like, hey, let me get to the principal secretary and actually have all this, I have 50 questions ready. And they were like, you know, he's putting me off uh, and, and making me wait as typically they do. Um, you know, they were like fuzzing about attendance register. And I was like, okay, I want to know about and Greg, I want to know about how governance works. And they were talking about like figuring out a small software change that would make a particular field read only, you know, and they were trying to restrict who could modify that field. The discussion was about how to eliminate entries in the muster role. Uh, that claimed that the same worker had been at multiple work sites. You know, the strategy was to limit how workers can can change groups, et cetera. Um, you know, because once the worker joins a group, you know, the idea was that if you, you know, it, it should be locked in, they thought, because the restriction will allow to prevent, in this case, low level bureaucrats kind of falsifying reports. They will say this worker worked in this group and once, the other group and the other to kind of make, to solve that problem. They want to kind of freeze these worker groups. Uh, and they want to control it digitally. Uh, having previously worked uh, at a large software company and writing code myself, I, uh, I understood the technical discussions, of course, but actually missed the larger significance of what they were up to, right? Only after multiple meetings, uh, and I would say even actually in the writing process, did they actually understand the broader meaning of their focus on such a specific part of the system. What I came to understand is that seemingly inconsequential changes in, in administrative processes were central actually to fixing the problems of Andrega's governance uh, at the last mile. Upper level bureaucrats would constantly patch this, this uh, to maintain the program's autonomy and counteract the attempts of landowners and local members of political parties uh, to capture the program at the last mile, as well as the resistance from the lower level bureaucrats to the process of patching itself. You know, they, for, they, for, the, the, this is for, they focus on granular de de details because they understood the politics of implementation at the, at the last mile. The process of patching development, you know, has, has three features. I'll end with this. First, patching is a top-down. Uh, uh, the patch sender is at a higher level than the patch receiver. Second, patching is about fine-grained changes. Uh, patches are extremely specific and focused alteration to policy. Third, patching is iterative. Right. You bureaucrats send many patches as new information about problems in the field reaches them. Uh, it's, a, it's a process of continuous cycle of fine grained changes. Uh, it, it's, it's a set of incremental changes rather than a one time overhaul. Uh, it's a mechanism through which dynamic sub, sub national, in this case, state institutions can incorporate uh, local information to address implementation problems. And I, I say this, but I also in the, in the book, I end with expand hopefully expanding the, the framework of patching uh, that could be done at different levels. Uh, but empirically, in this case, it was obviously a process that was controlled in the bureaucracy. But I think the hope is that it allows for, and Rajendran here leads the way in some sense to kind of, uh, uh, like civil society groups can actually do the same thing, can actually force that patching to happen by finding, by focusing on very, very specific details of how programs are on the ground and then bubble that up. And, and, and that's usually a good um, uh, uh, signal. So patching development is ultimately a political process, right? While each patch may have only limited uh, local significance, uh, the cumulative impact of continued engagement uh, of these things, of these changes is potentially transformative uh, in, in, in fundamental ways. 
uh, you know, patching, uh, you know, I, I think uh, is also a pos you know, allows the possibility for redistributing power uh, during the implementation of a policy. Here you find uh, in the implementation of, 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 these, uh, of, of these processes, citizens were able to see records, not just see records, but able to rewrite the records. And that's a very small thing one could say, but it's also fundamentally how the state gets reimagined by a, norm, a marginalized citizen actually having a problem in a record and able to actually challenge it and allow for a rewriting of those records. So that's something uh, I, I, I think this, 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 uh, this, the potential there uh, is a lot more than the realities of, of where they've reached. So I'll, I'll end with this and I'm eager to hear uh, uh, your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, so moving on to our panelists, I would like to invite Sylvia and Rajendran. I'm so excited both of you are here uh, to begin by telling us a little bit about uh, you know your own work in the context of this ongoing relationship that uh, the book Patching Development kind of tries to organize around the relationship between technological solutions and how it's kind of related with the logic of development. Um, so in a way, I'm asking you the broadest possible question around how you rationalize the role of technology in development. But I think it would give us a much needed initial grounding to discuss patching as a peculiar form of technology-driven intervention in development projects uh, in India particularly. And then, you know, can we imagine it to be something that is much more global in its uh, consequences and you know, implications? So I'm going to invite Sylvia first uh, to open the discussion. And then we'll move on to uh, Rajendra. Yes, many thanks, Ranjit, and many thanks to the Data and Society Institute and uh, uh, Rajesh for an amazing open of today. I'm beyond excited to participate in the book launch of one of my favorite books in IT and development for the year, without in IT and development, one of my favorite books of the year, because that's what it is, Rajesh. And uh, thanks, Ranjit, for inviting me to open the discussion, so I'll try and be brief, not to steal the scene to the author here. I'm Sylvia, as um, Ranjit mentioned, I'm an Associate Prof of Information Systems at the University of Oslo. Uh, why am I here? Apart from being a very big fan, like I said, of this book and of Rajesh's uh, ethnographic work behind it, uh, for two reasons. So I'll introduce uh, my work and its relation with patching, both empirically and theoretically. Empirically, I'm also a researcher of anti-poverty programs in India. I've uh, My main focus is on the public distribution system, and I guess through the debate, I'll draw some analogies and differences in between, uh, for those that don't know, the public distribution system is the largest food security program of India, one of the largest in the world, also highly mediated through digital technologies. And I've also conducted one research project on the NREGA, indeed, also in the state of Andhra Pradesh. And uh, I know that the references will be shared after this talk. I'd like to quote here the work with colleague Diego Majorano from the University L'Orientale of Naples. And it was indeed a work that interacted directly with the last mile of the NREGA. So to answer Ranjit's question, I think Pachin, Pachin in a way gave me a vocabulary to articulate what I've seen on the field in terms of addressing interventions very much at the last mile and very much, I think, is crucial, the third point you just raised in your slide, Rajesh, that of incremental, step-by-step -step actions. Very often when we are placed in the, in the uh, position of working with digital technology and development, we expect, we expect the whole semantic domain of, of you know, the data revolution, a sudden, a transformative change, Whereas what I witnessed in the last mile is very much a patching process and an imp incremental process. Uh, and I'm very sure that Rajendra uh, will articulate uh, more uh, in detail uh, of how this process takes place with the beneficiaries of programs. So empirically, I think Rajesh, you gave me a vocabulary, so thank you. Uh, secondly, uh, theoretically, so how does my work uh, participate in a way of, uh, uh, in the idea of patching. Well, more at large as a researcher of ICT and development and more recently of data justice, so the forms of justice and injustice that are produced through, through data, uh, I became very interested in looking at how we can make sense of uh, uh, 
phenomena like the change of anti-poverty programs of very broad anti-poverty programs. Let's not forget that the Andrega is a right. People have a right to 100 days of employment per year. And I think it's very hard to articulate theory uh, that uh, tries to lump together, in a way, anti-poverty programs, because Rajesh's work is, uh, is, in fact, an amazing ethnographic work on one program, but is a work, uh, the theory of touching can be applied beyond it. And I'll super quickly quote my latest uh, work, co-authored with uh, Stefania Milan and uh, Emiliano Ferre, is a book called the COVID-19 from the margins that puts together uh, 47 contributions in five languages on how, uh, on the silence, the stories of COVID-19. Section three of this book is about datified social policies. So programs similar to the Andrega in Colombia, Peru, India itself and other countries. And I think the theory of touching that Rajesh puts forward very much helps us make sense of these examples at a cross national level. So I guess that was my brief introduction and many thanks again. And I'm very eager to hearing what the agenda has to say. Thanks so much, Sylvia. And thanks Data and Society for organizing this. And of course, thanks, many thanks to Rajesh for writing this fantastic ethnographic work. Uh, actually, for me, the best takeaway for Rajesh's book is I think it's more nuanced than it appears, uh, to be honest. And to be, I think, for me, the best part about the most important takeaway from the book is uh, the, the, the political context in which the entire socio-technical process was set in motion. So the fact that there has been a history of Dalit mobilization and there was a Dalit upper level bureaucrat who was, who was very concerned, not just concerned, but who was very interested in bringing about a social engineering at the ground level by altering caste relations. And he knows that uh, he, and, and as Rajesh also points out in his book, he knows that he cannot directly make an influence there. And that's why I think technology became a very important mediator for the social, en social engineering process that he, uh, that he set out to embark on. Now, I think in the context, in the, the, the context of patching that uh, Rajesh has laid down, uh, the, the principles that is uh, top down uh, attention to very minor uh, details and also the iteration aspect. I think all three played a role and these were principal ingredients in the way that it, 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 it happened in Andhra. Now, I think that's exactly where I think I would uh, take, a, uh, take a position and Rajesh also highlights in his book is uh, take a position of caution at this point in the sense that yes, there have been very good, uh, Rajesh's book is actually a very strong case study of the possibilities when you have the right ingredients of uh, political dispensation at the top, a sympathetic bureaucrat who cares about these things and also the, the, the kind of social audit machinery that's there that has a very active in uh, dealing with things. Now, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of, of patching, which has actually had a detrimental effect on the ground. And I think that's very important for us to keep in mind as well. And uh, he also articulates it in his book very nicely. But I'll just give you concrete examples of how that has happened. Uh, so, for example, there is, uh, there, there's been a history of tinkering with the payments architecture in, the, in Narega. Uh, so over the years, there have been many, many different payment mechanisms that, we, that have been tried out. However, payment delays continue to be a, an endemic problem. And I think somewhere fundamentally, it's not necessarily the architecture that's, uh, that's at fault here that needs to be tinkered with, but I think it's the political will. And I think, uh, once again, patching, when it works well, it needs all these ingredients to be well established, it needs to, it, it's like a nice football goal where everyone needs to be in sync. Whereas if, if any of them is at fault, then patching can be, uh, any of the steps in patching can be a little bit difficult and iffy. And that's exactly, uh, for example, in the, in the Narega payments process, the top-down patching approach has meant that there's acute monitoring of how states are able to generate the payment invoices on time. However, because there is no accountability framework for the iterative process and for the top-down design, 
the central government has not assumed any responsibility for the delays that it's causing. And once again, quoting an auditor, that social auditor that Rajesh writes in his book, that uh, one of the social auditors says that we have access to everything that's happening in the last mile, but we don't have any power to question the upper level bureaucracy. And that's an in important in in ingredient, which is central to if we need the idea of patching to be uh, a, a more a robust way of thinking about patching as a development paradigm, as a tech technology and development paradigm, it has to have very strong accountability framework at each stage of the patching process. Without a legal safeguard at, of what kind of top-down decisions are being taken, without a legal safeguard on the iteration, because a key ingredient of iteration is information that's flowing upward. Now, it's very critical as to who is providing information, what kind of information is being provided, and in what forms. And that's where I think, again, borrowing another metaphor, which I really liked from his book, is a flashlight approach, right? Uh, so who is showing flashlight at whom? And we don't have any kind of uh, control over that process. So I think uh, these are very critical, I would say, from our own experience on the ground, uh, which is as part of LipTech India, which is another organization that I've been part of, uh, we've been looking at each of these instances. We look, we collect people's testimonies from different areas. And more often than not, when there is a discrepancy between uh, people's testimonies versus what's available in the online record, that's, that helps us to understand the gaps between where is the, I mean, why are these gaps existing? So either the people are lying or the technology is lying. So I think the reality is we need, so that, that helps us understand the scale of the problems. And that's one of the things I think uh, we've been able to uh, understand very uh, successfully is that the devil is in the details as, uh, as it's pointed out. I'll just add one more thing here is that similar, for example, in the last mile patching case, uh, borrowing from the example from the book, the lower level bureaucracy was not in a position to change the kind of works that can be conducted in a particular panchayat in a village. Uh, and that was very useful. That was an effective strategy used by the lower level bureaucracy to counter the local power structures in the elite on the ground. Uh, however, that has also, that's a double-edged sword because they use the same, local bureaucracy has now used the same kind of uh, uh, approach to, to deter workers. When workers come to them saying, I didn't get paid uh, or whatever any other problem I, I demanded, but I didn't, didn't get work they use the same kind of uh, logic and the response to the workers. So I think that is a double-edged sword. Uh, so I think finally, I would like to say that the last mile challenges in the context of patching has been seen with a magnifying glass as Rajesh has done. But I think it's equally important for us to reverse the magnifying glass and have some kind of a, uh, of, of some kind of a minute details and understanding of how the top, top level bureaucracy is also complicit. If it's a good thing, it's very good, but if it's not, how are they complicit and how do we put an accountability framework around it? So I think I'll stop here and uh, continue the discussion further. So, you know, in, in all of these different articulations of what's at stake here, there is, there is a part of this uh, arrangement that patching brings about, which is about local relationships, right? So at one aspect of this particular problem is this issue that, you know, uh, there is a way by which patching to a certain extent is a way to take some power away from local actors. And there is an equally parallel argument to be made, which is kind of centered on, you know, local actors are the only people who can actually help you when an interface is not working for you as a beneficiary, right? So as soon as you take some of the power away from these people, uh, you know, from these street level bureaucrats as well as frontline workers, what you're simultaneously doing is that you're making it harder for the beneficiaries to actually approach the system. Uh, so there's one kind of relationship here, and there is another part which is kind of focused on this relationship between auditors, bureaucrats, and activists, and how that to a certain extent also plays a part in the, a variety of different ways in which patching works out, and who gets to play a role in basically articulating why to a certain extent certain intervention needs to be made in the first place, right? So I'm just curious about how you see these local arrangements to be working out. I think Rajendran started us really well off on this line of inquiry, but at the same time, I'm more curious about how do we kind of deal with these contradictions, specifically in the context of you know, a particular intervention that is being made from the top down, uh, which is incremental. So it kind of can be responsible, but at the same time, how that 
back and forth kind of works out is something that you know I would like to uh, like you to think a little bit more about as well. So my question primarily is how do these local arrangements different these different set of actors seem to impact patching uh, as a process and how do we actually rationalize where patching is effective in the context of these relations and where it might not be yeah th thank you for 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 the remarks and 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 I had a slide which uh, would have uh, I didn't I didn't get to uh, for time because uh, it had a slide uh, I'm looking at it now it's called limitations of patching uh, and I think uh, you know like I mentioned in the book the patching is a political process right which basically means politics is sometimes viewed negatively and sometimes viewed positively but it's actually neither right it's a it's about power right and so as Rajendran eloquently pointed out the there is a lots of uh, preconditions that exist in in this particular configuration of uh, a certain you know in this case Dalit leaders who became bureaucrats at the top and saw took adapted an Ambedkar vision and tied up with MK, you know, activists went to Rajasthan, got them in, created the social art institution, got NGOs. So there are certain all of the kind of ingredients that was put in, uh, and we can debate about the 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 the, the arrangements, the institution arrangements. But but you you know, but I think what Rajan was you know articulating uh, and 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 correctly uh, identifying is those you know, masala, those ingredients, the key, key things had to be added first uh, in and, and continuously. So, so it's, a, it's not, uh, uh, you know, so it's not somehow patching is gonna lead to, uh, to good results, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a framework to kind of think about these things. So it, could, it does lead to weakening discretion. There is, you know, there's this idea of solutionism. There is, you know, patching is distinct from it, but there is possibility to kind of, there's a mission creep, I put it in the book, to kind of go towards this constant fixing of things and create new problems. And that leads to, you know, he studied the pay, payment architecture. That's a clear, the case of, of that kind of thing that never ends. And, and, and I think more crucially, I mean, there's also people hide behind patches that rather than said, like, you know, there's, there's both positive and negative, right? You can say that, oh, things are always changing. So you can just exert power at the local level at the bureaucrat or hide from the politicians influence by saying it's not my doing, it's somebody else's, right? So you, these things allow for agency, you can't remove it. But fundamentally, I think the, the, the question, though I started off saying a lot of attention has been focused on the first mile, I'm going to focus on the last mile, the dependency is going to constantly bite back. The last mile depends on the first mile, right? Uh, and, you know, Andhra is at a particular stage of uh, social uh, mobilization and political will and all of that, all of the rest. It's not Kerala, for example, right? Uh, so, so in that sense, like the questions about is it possible for the upper level bureaucrats to open up records and and you know and be questioned on the decisions that they take on. Uh, for example, these meetings produce results, and some of them are private hearings after your public hearing. What happens to those things? That's not debated. And is the vigilance cell is supposed to take action on these findings? What happens? Again, I would think that my hope is that, as Rajin and uh, articulated, patching needs to get into that so, to the gear process too. They need to start instead of having discussions about in general. You need to start focusing on applying RTI, right information, on those records, on those things, and actually try and shape. The, uh, the the you know the discourse in some sense lip tech which uh, you know I'm part of and Rajan is you know is more centrally involved and, and Vivek and others and, and Sylvia too um, there is an attempt by civil society organizations to actually go and ask the use technology and data to open up records and actually start putting pressure in, in some sense take the flashlight up if you will right are different spots the bureauc this particular state you know, I examine there's a particular case here, let's say at the, at the local uh, mile that's been structured. But there's no reason and we need more groups like LibTech and others to kind of take the, you know, the flashlight on parts of, of, of the process that are not examined. So that's why I kind of move that we should shift from this kind of apolitical sunlight metaphor to a very political flashlight metaphor because it allows for uh, a political understanding. Uh, and so to your, answer to your question, Ranjit, I, I think it really, I mean, the, the whole, preconditioned or uh, that you can't kind of engineer away. There's no app that that you can kind of somehow create for uh, social mobilization to happen. I mean, you know, like, you know, Andhra is in a particular state, Bihar is in a different state now, right? To have these kind of, because uh, I started there to kind of have these records questioned and 
uh, the same level of control by the bureaucracies within the bureaucracies is not there. Why is it not there? It's not just because you know you can't get like a bureaucrat at the top. You have like enough. You know, you know, we know of people at, in Bihar who, with the, you know, I won't name them, but the IAS was a very well-meaning and very thoughtful. But unless you have the kind of uh, mobilized groups uh, mobilization that happens, it's not clear uh, that you can you can um, uh, you can get there. So I, I saw a question uh, or a prompt to look at the Q Q and A features. I hope Ranjit, can you? Help that so that we can we can. Uh, uh, I, I saw one question about gender. I just I just I just wanted to kind of answer it uh, because I think uh, both as a you know you know with the with the cricketing metaphor uh, you know a back foot defense uh, to that bouncer uh, or or a, you know let go. So I, I hope I, I, I adequately answered uh, that question because it's important to kind of answer it. Um, in Riga, a lot of the work is actually done by women. Uh, uh, majority of it, right? Uh, and and uh, and so the question is, you know, yes, I talk about power. What is the gender angle, right? My uh, and how much can I? How much have I captured it? I think, you know, uh, the uh, the I have not taken a gender lens that cuts across uh, all the processes, and I, I think that needs to be, uh, you know, both that needs to be taken. I should just, uh, you know, say that that's. But that said, you know, in terms of actually examining the you know the the benefits of the program right and rega actually genders uh, gives wages uh, equal wages to men and women and that i saw in practice as well uh, you know women the you know having women as social auditors in the village uh, can they be and that's a question that you know was uh, that i talk about in the book and the kind of uh, you know discussions that people had have about you know could you have somebody who's, you know, usually sons and daughters of Indrega workers to go and travel to a different place? Are they safe? You know, and, and, and what are the kind of challenges they face, particularly among auditors uh, and how the perceptions of other male uh, auditors to kind of having a woman in the presence and uh, would that like lead to conflicts and, and problems and, and uh, perceptions of what's happening in these public meetings, you know, uh, because it, it, you know, this whole idea of social audit process in a, you know, is very, very like, uh, you know, uh, both performative in the sense that people worry so much about what dress people wear because that lends a sense of authority. Uh, and and so, you know, it, you know, what do they eat? Uh, uh, you know, should they allow to be eaten a meat? And is it a Brahmin conspiracy, for example, to kind of have, uh, you know, prevent the Dalits, for example, to eat meat? All these discussions happen. Similarly, like, should you, you know, should you have women in these in these meetings? Uh, uh, but the MKS, the the social audit unit was run by women, and she's very very uh, strong. And 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 the lots of uh, managed to actually hire a bunch of women at different levels of the uh, of the hierarchy, and that played a huge uh, huge role in um, you know some of what they were able to achieve. But my own interviews, I mean, I I you know I spend a lot of time, but there is definitely a, lot, a question of access in terms of what I was able to. Uh, you know, get in in terms of stories at the local level, and there was definitely some limitation, both empirically but also theoretically. And that that needs to be, you know, there's more work to be done, need to be done to kind of, uh, you know, see how uh, how these processes that I'm talking about uh, 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 would would shift if one takes a a strong, much more stronger gender lens. And I would just end with saying, you know, I'm uh, you know, like Peter Evans, one of my advisors, would say that you know, if you study a phenomenon. Uh, as long as you come back and say there are like five different ways that you know that I could have you know studied this, and if I'm one among the five rather than one among the thousand possible interpretations of the phenomenon, so I'm I'm hoping that this the the stuff that I've discussed uh, you know is is at least one of the five ways of of, of thinking about you know salient issues that come out of these uh, of these of these programs. But that's a great question. So Ranjit, I'll let you kind of look at the questions and bubble it up. Is that is that reasonable? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, my plan was to ask uh, that question that was raised uh, that you that you've already answered. Okay. Uh, I wonder if the uh, you know uh, other panelists have uh, you know a way to respond to the question, and then we can take one more. I think that's the um, the about the, about the time that we have. But you know, I'm really curious as to how uh, Rajendra and Celia would respond to uh, you know these on the ground challenges of thinking about these issues specifically in the context of gender and how that was a certain extent also reshapes the local arrangements that are at stake here. 
I'm afraid I, I'm, I, I unmuted myself the moment I heard the word gender. So it's, um, I'll be brief because the time is what it is. But I, I, I'd like to thank, first of all, very much Sarita who asked the, the question. Um, Rajesh gave a great, great base to it. I think gender is one of the many themes that make, and gender as in the agency of women workers in the NREGA, something I also witnessed in my field work in the same areas as uh, Rajesh. And uh, um, by the way, I, I can't quote Rajesh more when he questions the term unskilled labor. I was also helping out a couple of days in the field. Unskilled, unskilled, seriously. Anyway, and, and I think this is something that the problematization of key terms, unskilled, corruption, is something that uh, is very, very strong in Rajesh's book. To answer the question, I think the gender aspect, so again, the agency of women workers, uh, is something that makes the NREGA and also the NREGA in Rajesh's ethnography an extremely uh, powerful, um, in a way, difference from other anti-poverty programs. Like I said before, most of my research is on a food security program, the PDS, that while being uh, the actually the oldest uh, anti-poverty program in post-independence India, it is also a program that has a much lower, at least by design, interaction with the beneficiary. So I did witness work of village committees in both my field states, that's Karnataka and Kerala, and there are village committees, there are volunteer committees. There is not, however, the same level of worker agency and worker plus volunteer. You also detail very much in the social audits process, in the discussion of the work with volunteers, uh, very much this aspect of agency. So how can gender come to the attention of those who do the patching, uh, well, first of all, by, again, the direct action of those that are involved in the works. And I think this makes the NREGA very different from, uh, for example, large cash transfer schemes, large, large food security schemes. And, uh, and that's another, an, another aspect that, uh, so the, the agency of the worker that uh, your empirical chapters capture a lot. So wanted to make this note. Ajit, if I may just add a quick point, I'll give you another example from very recent times. Uh, so in, in every Narega work site, there's, there's a person called the mate. And mate is, think about the, and mate is a woman, uh, predominantly in every work site. Mate is, think of a group of, if there are 10, 15 workers, then the mate represents the 10, 15 workers, and that's usually a woman. Now, what we witnessed last year, for example, was that, again, it's an example of a top-down decision where uh, the government, the upper level bureaucracy decided that they are going to segregate the payments of workers based on the caste category of the workers. And what that resulted in was that in a work site, when there are people of different caste categories and the mate belongs to one caste, and uh, if the members of the other caste got their payments quicker than the caste of the mate, that was causing a lot of caste tension. So it's an intersectionality of caste and gender uh, that we could say that played out uh, in, in this kind of a top-down, it's, it's classic top-down, detail-oriented attempt. And fortunately, because there was a lot of public pressure, that guideline of segregating payments by caste has been rescinded now. But I think, again, thankfully, the iterative aspect, the third element of patching kicked in, in some sense. Uh, but there's, that's just one example of uh, the discussion that we were having. Right. So this actually brings me to another question that was asked by an audience, which is uh, kind of focused on what types of records uh, can be challenged or modified. Uh, so is it only publicly available items that can be basically, you know, questioned, challenged, figured out in, in a variety of different ways? Or is it also about health records, police records, education records, you know? What is at stake here? Because I think the examples that we are currently talking about are to some extent publicly accessible so that there's a lot more, you know, uh, flashlighting that is possible on these records as opposed to others which are kind of kept secret. Uh, and, you know, that taking that uh, as one of the questions, uh, I was also, you know, wondering about how we will basically conclude this conversation and basically talk a little bit about, you know, what are the one takeaway that all of you uh, can give us as we kind of move away from this conversation and come to the end of the hour. 
Yeah, well, I mean, um, it's hard to kind of uh, react to uh, in abstract, but I think in, in terms of specifics about the, you know, what is a lot, what's, what's gets seen in this program is what gets opened up, right? And what gets opened, right? RTI is an act that allows for government records to be opened up. Not all records, right? There are, there are restrictions about what can be opened. And again, that's a struggle of the first mile that need that 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 continues to happen, right? And so what 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 gets seen uh, in, in what gets digitized is also uh, is is a political question, right? Goes back to the I think Rajesh Hannibal uh, Hannibal asked this question about. Uh, uh, political economy of of patching those questions are important so the what gets what what gets to who decides what to patch and what information gets to be digitized is obviously in this case restricted right by the first mile questions about political economy of who who the upper level bureaucrats decided that certain words certain things are important and the auditors for example wanted to kind of open up more more payment more records but that was not part of the process right and so they still you know that's a process of contestation um and so yeah so it's 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 a it, you know so in 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 you know i would say that those are all questions that is part of the framework that uh that you know i hope this allows for asking that kind of question what who decides what records are opened up why only those records who gets to see it where they see it which are digitized which are not digitized those are questions that i guess i if i, I you know as if we start worrying about those details i think i've declared victory you know because those are it's not to say that andra has gotten it correctly right but the the what I want to push very you know and I'm hoping is that those are discussions that we should be having, not just about which political party gets to power or are they putting Enrega money. What is the budget of Enrega, which is all important questions, but also about these details about where who is who is why did they open up master roll, not the materials? Why is it not digitized, right? Why is you know like the attendance you know who showed up to the Enrega worksite is getting somehow more attention because workers felt like oh gosh I was there as a field worker of you know participating they was lingering longer in the worksite they thought oh I am like somehow kind of surveilling them and you know that's that is partly true right because they there's so much gaze on in these records they're worried that uh, the workers were worried that uh, why am I why are these folks kind of having such oversight on Enrega work. Uh, you know, and not about other things that other bureaucrats are doing. So those are all great questions. And I think we should just keep asking those questions. And then in multiple programs, and somebody said, what is the connection with public health? Well, if we have a social audit process, if we have like some of these, we can actually get that uh, processes going, right? In COVID, for example, we've, it's a black box. You know, we should actually have a social audit process, which we have some, you know, some of these records digitized and then start actually having these kind of discussions about, you know, what is who's got discretion? What kind of records are getting opened up? How many people are dying? How is this reporting happening? And some of the work Rajan is doing in terms of tracing, like the, the nightmare of tracing the pipe, you know, the you know, in the payment infrastructure. It's it's very hard. Uh, and so, you know, so we shouldn't be discussing about other good, bad. There are multiple others, right? As as some some people here in the audience I know have seen their names, uh, have studied. And so it's it's a much more complicated, uh, messy attention to detail. And I I I'm and one. One last thing I want to say in, in summary is that these things are not technocratic. They are very political. And I think that if that if we recognize that and we accept that, uh, because one, uh, you know, somebody dismissed, uh, you know, early on saying, well, you know, Andhra would get this right because they actually have a political will and they actually have. Well, it's true. But I think, as you see, you're undercutting the agency of the bureaucrats and the auditor, audit actors who actually paid attention to these details and fought that last mile power, right? And so that should be a lesson that it's not technocratic, it's actually political. Fantastic. Uh, we have two minutes to close. Uh, any last thoughts, Rajin Ben Sudhir? I make a super quick point and that's by the book. And uh, uh, not only by the book, but if you are an academic like myself, please order the book for your university library. It's uh, incredibly easy 
as, and it's not always so, let me tell you that. And uh, Oxford University Press has been, I've ordered the book the moment it went out for my university, University of Oslo. And it's a very simple process for those of us in academia to order the book for the university library. So to make it easily accessible for uh, um, reading lists and students. That's my only final remark with many, many thanks. It's been so, so, so exciting to be um, in uh, this conversation today. Thank you. Thanks, and actually seconding what Sylvia said, I think it's uh, definitely given me a very good framework to think about a lot of things that many of us do as practitioners, as academics, and uh, also one of the things I think as just as a as a final comment, I think while this, I, I and I do agree that these choices, the te the technical choices that uh, any bureaucracy adopts is a deeply political choice, and one question as people who are, ha who have to, as, as people who care, we have to throw, show the flashlight on the, on the administration and the political dispensation is, are these, are these kind of patches or are these kind of technical interventions that are being introduced? Is it, are they increasing the political capacities of the workers or not? Ultimately, I think if the political capacities of the workers are, the rights holders doesn't have to be Narega, it can be any other right. Uh, if their political capacities are getting improved, if they have a better claim making with the state and its institutions, then I think it's a, it's a great thing. We should adopt it regardless of what it is. But on the other hand, if it's atomizing them and if it's a deterrent to any kind of collective action or to borrow another friend, Vivek's term, decentralized collective action, uh, then if it is a hindrance to decentralized collective action, then I think it's it's a it's it's not a good idea. So I think I'd end on that prescriptive note. Uh, but many many thanks to all of you. I think it was fantastic to listen and hear to all all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rajesh, for a wonderful book, and thank you, Rajinder and Sadia, for joining us. Uh, thank you for all of the audience for being here and basically listening to us for one hour. I'm very grateful and thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you indeed. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much.